You are listening to Rebel Femme Podcast, Lady Bits, Episode 3. I'm your host, Marella Manelli, and I'm Yadira Munoz. We spend a lot of time servicing women behind the chair in our pink hair salon. And believe it or not, we know more than we sometimes want to know about what goes on in our clients' lives. In this podcast, we are going to get real and raw. Tune in as we have honest conversations about women's issues, beauty, life, and everything super random. No topic is off limits. So make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode. All right, welcome back to our third podcast. And today is a very special day for us because we have our very first guest um, (laughs) on our show. (laughs) And her name is Leanna. Hello. Hello. And we also have a very special topic that we're going to be covering today, um, something a little bit more serious. um, But we're going to keep it light and fun, too, because... That's just how we roll. <laughs> I don't know. Roll. Maybe we'll cry. I don't know. We'll There'll see. be tears. There'll be tears. <laughs> oh, no. I'm not prepared for this. <laughs> so what we're going to be talking today is, or what we're going to be talking about today is our lady bits, but specifically endometriosis. And you said it right. I did. <laughs> so Yudira um, has been trying to correct me for like a week now, and I've been saying endometriosis incorrectly for pretty much my whole life, <laughs> or since I learned about endometriosis, I've been saying endotrometriosis. Endotrometriosis. <laughs> so if I pause before saying endometriosis, it's because I have to like actually make my brain say it. So. <laughs> Pardon me. (laughs) Just keep saying it over and over again. (laughs) Uh, So maybe we can start off with Leanna. (laughs) I'm really bad with names, too. too. It's good. So maybe just, you know, introduce yourself and um, just tell us who you are, and then we'll kind of go over some little facts. Sure. My name is Leanna. Um, I've known Yadira for a really long time, but then not. It's very strange, our relationship. It is. But then we (laughs) found out we both had endo, and it was kind of like, oh, my kindred spirit is like, I don't know. I kind of reach out to her a lot if I'm not feeling well or if we find something out about endo. So Same. Um... There's really nothing special about me. I don't know what to say. Well, what do you do for work? Um, I work uh, for insurance. I work for Caloptima Medical. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with that. <laughs> Maybe we can kind of like tap on that subject too. We know yeah, for sure. under this because um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we can. That's yeah, true. that's a big window right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I, you know, definitely have had my fair share of um, Medi-Cal and Cal-Optima. It's a very confusing kind of process. So I think, you know, anyone that has a chronic, you know, illness or something they're dealing with on a constant basis, like, I always, like, wonder, like, with the broken system. (laughs) I'm going to call it a broken system. No, for sure. Uh, You know, how do people handle that? So we'll we'll definitely tap into that. Um, and I guess, so you guys went to high school together? We did. We did yeah. Okay. Well, why don't you tell us, I'm curious what your, I guess, because you said you have an interesting We just history. talked and then didn't talk yeah. for a really long time, but kept in touch because of social media. Exactly. Oh, okay. So, you know, you just kind of know what people are up to because Yay, of you don't really have yeah. to, like, check sure. in. You're just keeping tabs, yeah. watching them. Hey, from like, <laughs> double tap that picture and be like, what's up? You're good. Cool. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> um, so that's how we've kept in touch, really. She cut my hair yeah. a long time ago in, oh, her, yeah. in her garage. I was just out of beauty school, yeah. I think. Or was I still in beauty school? No, I think you may still have been in beauty school. Yeah. And it's still, like, the best haircut I've ever gotten. Yeah. Aww. Honestly, it's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> my heart. <laughs> so I actually don't know anything about endometriosis. Dude, I think I, I didn't say that one right. That's okay. You did. Okay, okay. But I actually don't know much about it. And so, and you, Yadira, you have, like, a history oh, yeah. with Indo. So why don't you, I guess, share with our listeners? So I got diagnosed, I think, when I was 25. Okay. So a little bit later, I always knew that there was something wrong. Ow, you just slapped me in the head. There's a mosquito <laughs> There's on a your head. Mosquito. <laughs> it likes my brains. <laughs> Oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> Diagnosed at 25. Diagnosed at 25. Always had issues with my menstrual cycle. Would go to doctors, tell them that I was in a lot of pain, that my periods were really heavy, and they would turn around and say, 
oh, you need to fix your diet and exercise more. And at that point in my life, I was vegan. My health was amazing. And, and I was, you were really skinny. And I was really skinny. I was running <laughs> at least four miles every other day. I so I pictures looked. Pictures of you skinny. <laughs> Don't rub it in. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> so I would just look at them and be like, what am I supposed to change? Like, oh, add meat to your diet. It physically hurts <laughs> to eat animal <laughs> at that point in my life. And they're like, mm, that's what you need. That's what's going to fix everything. Wow, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Until, like, I actually landed in a hospital for pain. That's when I think I was taken more seriously. Okay. So that's kind of, like, really how you guys connected? Would yeah. You say? Yeah. Like, we had or friends got closer. in common. Yeah, we always had friends in common. It's like, oh, I think we just knew who we were. Exactly. Um, but then once I think I became like vocal about it online and I posted something you commented on it Yudira. yeah and then I was like oh man someone I know because up until that point I had never met anyone who had it as same well. and it was such a relief to yeah. like have somebody to I guess share that connection and just commiserate over what we were going through because it's not super common yeah and, and I you didn't tell know someone that you have it and they're like you have what what is that? And then you have to go into this whole thing. It's when the lining of your <laughs> uterus, you know, it's really not, not embarrassing. It's just like tedious to have to explain every single time. Yeah. So right. a lot of the times I'm just like, it's like a reproductive thing. And I think people just kind of like, oh, okay. Like they don't want to hear about your yeah. reproductive problems. So they kind of let it go. Yeah. Cause I think, um, it's, it's almost kind of like taboo. Yeah. Um, and yeah. especially to, even with like, um, I don't know. I, I, the only thing I can think of is to like, it, depending on like the cultural background you come from, like I know in like my family, we did not talk about like lady parts like at all. Right. Or um, periods. I, or mm -mm. periods. And I even remember being 13 years old or 12 years old and I went to a Catholic school and I would oh. ask my mom, what does virgin mean? Oh, really? And she was like, where did you hear that from? Well, the Virgin Mary. And I said, from the Virgin Mary, what does that mean? She's like, well, I'll tell you when you're older. So it was very, like, a hush-hush. Yeah. Hush. So I could totally see, you know, some families where you just don't talk about it or it's, like, it's, you know, your private parts and you just don't, you yeah. know. Yeah. So this is great that we're having this um, podcast because, you know, maybe somebody can feel connected to what you guys have to share today, too. Yeah. So I wanted to go over a couple facts. Um, so I found these kind of interesting. Yadira um, did some further research. So one in 10 women are diagnosed with endometriosis during their reproductive years. So anytime between 15 to 49. So I actually have a question about that. So can you get endometriosis like later in life? Like yeah. you can have like a normal, you know, uh, menstrual cycle pretty much through let's say your 40s and then, or your, your your 30s and then in your 40s can you then get it yeah, yeah I think they don't really know when someone gets it I've heard recent studies where they say that they've done research on um, fetuses um, who show signs of endometriosis I know that's kind of dark um, but they don't really know when you get it. It's a matter of your symptoms because the only way to diagnose it is by having a surgery, yeah. a laparoscopic surgery. So the doctor can tell you, I think you may have it, but you're not actually diagnosed with it until you have a surgery and they look inside of oh, you. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's is like, horrible because that's yeah. invasive. Open yeah. you up just to, to take a look. Yeah. Wow. Um, so here it says approximately... Uh, 176 million women worldwide, if all the women formed a country, it would be the seventh largest country in the world. So 176 million women worldwide have endometriosis. Wow. Yeah. That fact blew my mind. Yeah. Especially it's just the ones that are diagnosed with it. Yeah. You know, These aren't even like out there have pain or are going through stuff that doctors don't even take them seriously. They can't even get to the point where you and I are, and it's frustrating enough for us to yeah. have to deal with it. I think it's one of those things, too, where, you know, you physically can't see right. the pain, right? There's something that you individually experienced, so it's like, how can 
you know, um, I hate to, to say this, but like a man, you know, <laughs> which a lot of doctors and physicians are male. Men. Yeah. And, um, or even a female that, you know, doesn't have it or suffer from it. And maybe they have like mild periods or whatever. So like, how do they like connect with that or, you know, how do they see it? So that's why I think too, like. You can't physically see the pain. <laughs> yeah, because there's, um, even when, like, for example, you bail on a friend or you call out sick and you come in the next day and you look fine because I got up in the morning mm -hmm. and did my makeup and, you right. know, did my hair or whatever. And they're like, you don't look sick. Yeah. Oh, damn. I didn't know I had to open up my belly to show you what's growing <laughs> inside of yeah. me, you know? So that's really tough. And, of course, I myself don't, you know, if I don't feel well, sometimes I put a little more effort into the way that I look just to make myself feel better. Exactly, because it's like that feeling. Yeah, like, you feel better. Look good, feel good. Exactly. And it's, it's a lot of the times it's met with, oh, you don't feel good and you did your hair. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, it's met with a lot of backlash, I think. I know um, you, Yadira, because Yadira and I work together, I sometimes like she'll she may or may not tell me like she's feeling well or not but then like she just like pushes through the day yeah. and then or she'll be here with like her heating pad mm -hmm. <laughs> like best friends yeah <laughs> so yeah I, I definitely you know I don't I think for me like um I think maybe you don't probably don't share a lot of times when you are in pain though like you do and you don't I try not to because I just feel like I sound like a broken record or I just don't want anybody to be like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> I try to make myself feel fine or pretend to be fine just to get through it. So would you say that it's like, like you have days where it's like super debilitating where you have to call out of work or you have to like stop everything what you're doing? Like it affects For your daily sure. life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. how so? Like, um, it's, it's this feeling where you wake up and you open your eyes, you're like, fuck. Like, no. <laughs> yeah, not today. You know, it's just not going to happen today. You get up to use the restroom and you're already, like, hunched over. It causes a lot of inflammation. Um, so sometimes I can't even put my jeans on to go to, like, work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's always the worst. I yeah. always, I'm, like, bawling my eyes out trying to put my clothes on. Yeah. So I have to ask, so you got diagnosed, at Yadira, at 25. Yeah. How, what, what age were you? you having like really terrible type of menstrual cycles i remember them in high school and what about what about you yeah i was diagnosed at 23 okay um my i always had really terrible cramps mm -hmm. what i thought were cramps um but i just just i chalked it up to being a girl and that's what i had to deal with same they were always really short periods so i just thought like oh that there's nothing wrong because I have short periods. It's fine. I'm not bleeding a lot, whatever. But now that I look back on it, I, re I remember being like at lunchtime in high school and like, like, oh, just hunched over. Everyone was kind of talking and mingling. And I was just like sitting in the corner waiting for my cramps to pass. And that's not normal, you know? So now looking back, I can see how much I kind of endured thinking it was normal lady bit stuff, you know? <laughs> and it wasn't. So here, one of the studies, it says 23,000 women with ovarian cancer, cancer found that women with endometriosis have three times more the risk of developing clear cell ovarian cancer and two times the risk of developing endometrioid tumors. <laughs> <laughs> endometrioid tumors. <laughs> so what does all that mean? <laughs> you can dissect that for me. <laughs> one I'm honestly not too sure about that one but it just sounds like to me like you have a higher chance of getting ovarian cancer and just developing tumors in your endometrium yeah and your endometrium I think um women with endometriosis too have a higher chance of developing cysts which is actually how I got diagnosed same um, so I think cysts can lead up to cancerous cells if I'm not mistaken um, so I think that's why we have a higher chance of it. Yeah. So I know, I know cysts are fairly yeah. normal to, yes. to develop. Um, cause I've had some and some of them had like, you know, some that are large that they're like, mm, we're going to watch this right. one, but then I'll, they'll say, oh, you have other ones, but they're, they're normal. Like, and I'm like, oh, so it's normal to have them. So yeah. I've been told that it's from normal. my doctor that they're normal. They're like, it's something that we develop. So how would like cysts 
for somebody who suffers from endo be different? Um, it like, are they larger or? Yeah. So a lot of the time it's if they're larger and if there's like a cluster of them on an ovary, because that's where they tend to develop is on an ovary. Okay. And that's where it's more high risk. It can actually flip the ovary. It can contort the ovary. Yeah. yeah. And then there's a uh, part of the endometrium, like the whole quote unquote reasoning for endometriosis is because the the blood oh they say it's like backed up yeah period like blood. back back in oh, and wow. it creates like a studies chunk. that it's like not the not case that. yeah i just think there's just so little known about it yeah like, there's like still that, needs a lot of research yeah. and more to be known yeah. is that what causes the chocolate cysts yes so i that's how actually i got diagnosed Wait, a chocolate cyst yeah. yeah what the hell is a chocolate is cyst? that what you had too i had that yeah. too yeah so i i had pain for about six months, and I just thought, oh, man, where's your kidneys, guys? Like, where do I, I think I have a kidney infection. Like, it just yeah. started because it was in my back, in my lower oh, left-hand wow. side. And then I started, I had a little bit of, like, ovarian pain on my left side, and I thought, oh, I'm just, like, ovulating. That's no big deal. I just didn't think the two were connected. Um, finally, I landed in the ER, and they did a CT scan and an ultrasound, and they found a large cyst. They said, we'll watch it. It'll go away. No big deal. A week later, I was back in the hospital. So they said, well, it's causing you a lot of pain. Let's go ahead and go in there laparoscopically and take it out. When they went in there, they saw a chocolate cyst. So it's just really a cyst that's full of blood. That's like old and yeah. oh, wow. it's been just living there. Yeah. Rather than like a cyst with like clear fluid or right. what have you. Um, so that was how I got diagnosed. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So... The big question is, and I know we talked a lot about these like little facts, but what is endometriosis? Like, what exactly is it? <laughs> Do you want to take that one, Leanne? <laughs> um, so again, um, it's said to be similar tissue. I don't want to say the same because now it's like it's not the same tissue, but it's similar tissue to that of the tissue that grows inside your uterus when you are pregnant. Um, oh yeah or like ovulating. So it's really the lining of your uterus that protects the egg for um, insemination. Okay. So it's just like a part of your menstrual cycle that's supposed to shed yes. with. So monthly you shed it, right? Regular person, it grows in your uterus only and it sheds. But for us, similar tissue will grow outside of the uterus. Um, it can grow in your bladder. People have had it in their lungs. Um, Oh, wow. I mean, yeah, it's there's one where it's like... In the brain, I've yeah, heard. Up yeah. into the brain. But that tissue doesn't know where to go because you're it's growing outside of where it's supposed to be growing. So it will attach to um, your bowels, your bladder, what have you. And then it, the pain it ca is caused by the inflammation of it because hormones will kind of stimulate it. So, the, so then how does it come out? It doesn't. Mm-mm. So it's there forever. Oh, uh, well, that's why... Until you get a had surgery. Four, oh, I've had four <laughs> surgeries. And I've had three. Yeah. Wow. So, and this is... Um, so if you have it growing, like, let's say, on your bladder, you have to uh, get it surgically removed. Yes. And this is something that only affects women. Yes. Yes. Wow. Okay. So that's something, like, new I had no freaking clue about. Yeah. That's why I always say that's that so I have, scary. like, cobwebs. Yeah. Because it's literally like cobwebs attaching to my intestines, my, well, most recently, my lower, like, left intestine, I think, on the left hand, left hand side. So it's basically absorbed my left ovary and oh, covered wow. it. Dude, me too. High five. I don't know if that's a high five moment, but. <laughs> me too. Do you still have your, like, both ovaries? I do. I had my left ovary removed because that Cause happened. Because of that. Yeah. They can't find mine. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Because so, of all of this growing So if you can't there. find your ovary, let's say it's like, like it's covered. Yeah. Does that ovary still work? It can. Yeah. I have, um, it's still attached. It's just covered in. But does it, I guess, because it's only growing on the outside. So I'm, I'm just curious, does it grow? In? Does it somehow penetrate or does it put too much pressure on the ovary because i think of ovaries as like a male's testicles they're very delicate <laughs> right yeah my right? my um left ovary was removed because the endometriosis had actually covered the fallopian tube and it was no longer so it was constricting yes it. 
so it was no was longer actually anything passing through it. The eggs were just like sitting pretty and nothing just was completely happening. out of yeah. commission. Wow. So, yeah. So you're basically saying that because it grows on the outside and then you you still get the the line the regular lining that you normally would get from your period or it's just there forever. So the hormones will stimulate it so then it gets like you get swelling, you get pain because it's growing. Your body is like telling you like something is there that's not supposed to be there. So that's what causes the pain. So even if you were to stop, this is why women who have hysterectomies continue mm -hmm. to have pain. Yeah. Uh, doctors oh, will push you and say, well, then have both ovaries removed, remove your uterus. Everything will be fine. But and there's plenty. That is not a definitive no, cure. There's plenty of women who have everything removed. They're like scooped out. They're 22, 23 years old and they continue having pain because the endometriosis is still growing elsewhere. It's, yeah. Because it's hormone driven. Correct. Yeah. Um, so I guess, um, and I'm sorry if I'm asking like dumb questions, no, but no. I told you, dear, I was like, I'm going to ask probably a lot of dumb questions, no, but I think a lot of people who are like me that know nothing about it. Um, so I guess like you, cause you're still having a, a menstrual cycle, but they're more debilitating when you have your menstrual cycle so you're still growing the regular tissue that or lining that you normally would in your uterus mm -hmm. for your menstrual cycle mm -hmm. so it's the combination of that with the hormones and the is it because of the the period or is it because no no okay. <laughs> yeah i mean i remember i guess i'm, I'm trying i'm trying to put the words in the the right way here because i'm like i i i'm just saying as um i know it you know, Yudira has come in or has told me like, oh, I'm not feeling well. So yeah. it's like a combination of, you know, her period along with. I'm other sure symptoms. that's like 10 times worse. But it, I remember when I first started having symptoms, it was, oh, the week of my period. And then it was the week of and the week before. And then it was the week before the week of and then the week after. And then all of a sudden there was just no time of not having pain. Yeah, it was just more consistent. So this is definitely more hormone driven. Yeah. So if it's yeah. hormone driven, it, um, is it something that, you know, like birth control can help or fix or? That is the first thing that any doctor will put you on is some type of hormone therapy, like just to try to fix it. But it's not something that I feel actually fixes it. It helps with um, a lot of females with endometriosis have really heavy, really long periods and it helps that in that sense it shortens it it keeps it on time it doesn't give you like two weeks of period one week without and then another two weeks it just regulates everything uh so i don't know if either one of you want or maybe both of you it's up to you guys <laughs> want to share i guess like your like history and like kind of what you've gone through so far because you already mentioned that you had an ovary removed so I'm just like curious like I guess like how did you get to that point like how did it start and how did you get there and where are you at now um so when they first discovered can I yeah of course <laughs> <laughs> um when I first discovered that I had it or when they discovered I had it um it was May 2012 by August 2012, I I had already had a surgery, so they said, oh, we removed it, we burned it off, it's fine. By, I think, like, August, September, I was having pain again. So this was months later. Um, nothing had changed, so I went in for another surgery. I think within, like, six months of my first one. And they did the same thing. They just burned off. They cauterized the endometriosis that they could find. It was very, it looks like spider webs. It's like connecting one organ to another. It was terrible. I was diagnosed with like stage three, whatever. Then um, after that, they actually wanted me to try Lupron. Mm. So Lupron is, it pretty much puts you in menopause. It's like a dose away from like chemo too right yeah so actually lupron um is what they give males with prostate cancer um it's the same thing so i got a i got two doses for i think six months and it stopped my periods it put me in menopause but then it was the worst six months of my life because um, i thought the pain was gonna go away i thought i was gonna feel better but here i was i think like 24 in, in menopause, um, having hot flashes, and I was in a terrible mood all the time, and I still had pain. 
Um, so I just didn't know, like, you know, how doctors could be so quick to, you know, p inject me with this medication that's like chemo, um, promising me that I was going to feel better, making me feel like I was crazy for not jumping at the chance of taking it. Because they're like, well, why don't you just do this? This is like going to completely solve your problems. You're crazy if you don't do it. Mm hmm. Um, so then after that, I had another surgery. No. Rewind. <laughs> uh, after that, they actually sent me to see a fertility specialist um, so that I could have um, my, like, fertility levels checked. Yeah. Um, basically, what they told me was that I was like a 47-year-old woman in my hormone levels. Like, wow. Yeah. So they said, you're never going to get pregnant if you don't try now. You really need to. Don't you want to be a mom? So I went and I did insemination at 25. Holy cow. Yeah. And I was kind of bullied into it by the doctor. I thought, he's right, man. Don't I want to be a mom? This is my only chance. I have a chance right now. I spent a lot of money. Like, th thankfully, at the time, I had a job that covered a lot of fertility stuff. Um but I did that and it didn't work and I kind of was happy about it because then I realized that it was something that I really should have thought twice about and the doctor should not have done that. So then after that I had pain again and with the idea that I just wanted to feel better, the pain was really on my left side. So the doctor said, well, if it's on your left side and it's your left ovary and there's really no flow on the left side, let's just remove it. And I thought, of course, why not? So they removed it and then... Um, I went a little bit more time without pain, and then I had another surgery after that. Wow. Oh, yeah. man. Well, I, you know, I, I think that, too, you know, in just our culture, and I, I would say probably say probably across the globe culture of just, you know, womanhood is like, oh, you have to be a mom or you have to, oh, yeah. you have yeah. to, like, birth the babies. Just hearing you say that just, like, is, you know kind of like eye-opening to me because I don't think that they should pressure you especially if you know you're you're so young like you're yeah. in you know I, I don't know what your um you know relationship status or and that probably doesn't matter either but it's just like if you're not in a place or a time where you're like ready to to be a mom or to have kids then why, why pressure that yeah. because I mean there's so many other avenues and and things that would define what a mom is it doesn't mean pushing you know a a, a baby out of your vagina so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know so that's just kind of like breaks my heart actually yeah. it makes me yeah. really sad yeah it was sad I was I mean I walked in there with no partner you know yeah. I had like a boyfriend but we weren't I mean 25 I wasn't talking about having kids so right. I walked in there with my sister with me and they actually thought, like, oh, so you guys want to have a kid together? I'm like, dude, look at my medical history. Like, yeah. it's my sister, you know? Like, I'm coming in here because you guys told me that I needed yeah. to see you ASAP or else I wasn't. He said, I give you a year tops. After that, you could kiss being a mom goodbye. Okay. That's heartbreaking. Yeah. Well, I just, I just don't think, like, that's something that defines being a woman it just doesn't no it doesn't but I think at the time and now I see that you know and I've learned to kind of cope with it and okay if it doesn't happen that way it's gonna happen another way if mm -hmm. I even want it to happen at all you know right but at the time it was oh the only thing that mattered to me and it was the most important I thought even after if they remove everything after that I'll be fine as long as I have one kid mm -hmm. 25 years old like you know I knew nothing right wow yeah <laughs> What about you, Yadira? Oh, sorry, that one, like, pulled at my heartstrings. Yeah. Um, I don't think my journey has been quite like yours. <laughs> we're, we're crying over here. I told you there'd be tears. <laughs> Fuck, dude. <laughs> that was intense. Yeah, no, um... My journey has not been quite like that, and it's just, it's rough. Um, my doctor just tried to cure it with birth control in the beginning, and 
I was very happy when I found her because she was the only person who actually paid attention to me and had me get an ultrasound, had me um, try different avenues. And then when I told her the pain was too much and I was going into the hospital or emergency rooms because I was in so much pain, that's when she... Oh, yeah, we got it. <laughs> we, we have a mosquito flying around here or a fly. Um, that's... Uh, when she finally told me, hey, you have this. Um, I don't know if you are fertile or completely infertile. If you want to try to have kids, uh, definitely try. And at the time, I think, yeah, I was 25 years old. And with George, I think we were living on our own, finally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we were I actually all... remember this time. And we were... Cause you, you, I remember you, you sharing a little bit about this with me. <laughs> we uh, weren't using the birth control. We tried, and nothing happened, and... <laughs> I'm gonna cry. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I knew I should have brought those damn tissues in here. <laughs> so we tried, and... It never happened. Fuck. <laughs> and it completely broke my heart because that was... <sighs> it broke my heart because that was my goal in life, to be a mom. <sighs> and to have that stripped away from me, just, it hurt a lot. And to have two more surgeries later, and to know for sure and definitive, I can't have kids unless I try IVF. I tried to just let it roll off of me, but it's hard. And then also you're told, have a kid and your pain's gonna go away. And it's bullshit. <laughs> yeah, have a kid and your pain's gonna go away. So you think, okay, so... This is the solution. This is it, and I can't do it. The one thing that my body was made, made to, to do. do, and I can't do it. Yeah, and of course, it's we know now it's not true. Women have children. And they still go through it. And they it. go through, you know, they go through it all. And of course, it's not to say that we can't. I mean... Who knows, you know, like, who knows what can happen with us. And they could tell us that I have zero hormones in my body that can make a child. And I have seen it happen with people that I follow online. And, um, you know, you, you think, oh, they're just like me. And then they get pregnant. You're like, fuck you. <laughs> you know? Like, fuck how? you. But, you know, that can be us, you know? So, yeah. I don't know. That's what I was just going to ask. So, what, um, what is the, I guess, the likelihood... So this is a really hard conversation for me to have because I'm sitting here pregnant <laughs> with number four. So it's like, you know, um, and I bitch and complain about it half the time. No. So this is this is a, a tough one for me to sit in on. But um, what or what are the chances? What because because I'm I'm just kind of sitting here like okay, well, birth control can you know ease possibly ease symptoms, but if you're on birth control, you can't get you pregnant. Can't get pregnant. Right. Because I do, I do hear stories of, of people who have endometriosis and they continue on, you know, to eventually, you know, have kids or maybe they go through, you know, um, a surrogate or, or something like that. There's yeah. like, there, you know, adoption, there's like so many other avenues, but if, you know, for you to like physically, you know, grow a human in your body, <laughs> <laughs> you know, how, what are, what is the likelihood of that happening? They're probably slim to none. I think I had, um, like a point something percent mm -hmm. chance, like let's say 0.5 percent chance <laughs> before I had my left ovary removed. Now that I've had it removed, it's probably like 0.1, you know? <laughs> no. Okay. Is that, is that something that's, you know, you still think about? I know this is like a really touchy question, but like, is that something that still like bothers you? that it's more than likely not going to happen? Or do you just kind of like, how do you get over that? Like, how do you move on from that possibility of just like really not having children? And I, and I only ask that from a point from you know, my, my perspective, because 
you know, I, I have kids and, um, you know, I, I have my own fertility issues. struggles and yeah. issues, um, nowhere near anything what you guys have gone through, but I know for me how emotional of a roller coaster it has been for me to like lose pregnancies and things like that so how do you like move on from that i mean do you you know no i don't think so like we both got emotional right away i just cried my eyes out you know like (laughs) i don't think you ever move on but i think at a certain point um i think the, the idea of having a kid especially going through um insemination it was like a really huge deal. I had to inject myself every day and go in for ultrasounds every other day. It was a really big commitment for quite a while for me. When it didn't happen, I started focusing on feeling better yeah. rather than what I was losing. You know, oh, I'm never going to be a mom. I mean, in the traditional sense, you know, mm-hmm. but exactly. God, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in bed. I'm not feeling well. I'm not living my life now. So I just kind of tried to focus on feeling better in the moment. Exactly. But of course it comes up, you know, kind of something, a thought in the back of your mind all the time. Yeah. And I always try to tell myself, like, I get so emotional when I speak about it, but that's also because I've already laid that part of my goal or, like, my dream to rest. Mm -hmm. Like, I've coped with it. I've dealt with it. And if it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be. I'm not going to try to force my body to do anything that it wasn't meant to do. It's probably gonna make you emotional too <laughs> but like the perspective from your mom or like you know or you like your family because um i don't know i, I just you know sometimes i i think like that's got to be heavy for like your your mom or your family to to deal with too because it has to break their heart you know what i mean that you're going through that because you're her daughter yeah um because it's it, like i you know again like i i look at my kids and i'm like when I don't know it could be something stupid like my son got in a fight with his friend and he's like really upset because they're not talking anymore and it, it affects it, you it affects yeah, me please. so this is super life changing so like well you're the sick kid right yeah <laughs> pretty much for me at least my mom um, thankfully she's never made me feel any less for not being able to give her a grandchild um I always tell her that Harley is her grandchild (laughs) and the only one she'll ever get from me. And and Harley is your dog. Yes. (laughs) That we talked about in the last podcast. She's never made me feel any less for, and I don't know if she has like had her own emotions about it or like what she's felt because she's never really told me and I'm thankful for it. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't put any more pressure on me or it doesn't make me feel a certain way. She's always been good that way. I've had other family members who have definitely been more of like the fighters. Like, oh, you should try to do this. You should try to do that. And I'm like, <laughs> but I can't. Yeah. I'm like, just, just let it be. Yeah. Yeah. Getting my dad to understand is a little harder. Yeah. He'll say, there has to be something that you can do. Yeah. Because I've been sitting here for nine (laughs) years just not wanting to take that magic pill that they're going to give me. You know, he's like, no, there's something they have to do. My mom's really supportive. But I think my my whole family, my sister, uh, my best friends, like, they've just been super supportive. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You're the sick kid, like, forever. Forever and ever. And I agree with you. Like, I think the dads, it's, it's a little bit harder. Yeah. Because they're the fighters. They're the ones that want to keep trying to do something new. And they don't understand fully what's going on. And it's something that I don't think they will fully understand yeah. ever. Because they don't have a vagina. <laughs> <laughs> we went to the um, an endometriosis march a couple weeks ago in UCLA. My, my parents went. My friends. My sister. And my dad. It was really funny. Because there, do- there were doctors up there. You know. Telling like the story of. You know, a lot of people and how endometriosis is diagnosed, blah, blah, blah. And I've, it's a lot of things that I've told my dad hundreds of times. But uh-huh. when he hears it from the doctors, he's like, see, you hear that? Oh, my God. Like, all of a sudden, <laughs> it's fact. But because I said it ten times before, it's, it had yeah. no no weight. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, actually, what are, what are the symptoms 
that's something we really haven't like honed in on. So what what exactly like how would somebody know to say, hey, I should probably go get this checked out because uh, you know there's it, it almost seems like there's lots of women who may have it don't know they have it. Yeah. So how would they be able to recognize and listen to their body? Um, I think that for one, if your periods are knocking you down, that's not normal. I think mm -hmm. that's one thing that women need to understand. It's not something that we just have to live with. It's not, oh, it's just your period. There's something wrong. We're supposed to be able to still function in the world while we are bleeding. It's, I mean, yeah. every, you know, we're supposed to be able to do it. So if you think I need to take days off of work, I have to cancel things that's already kind of like a red flag. And is this pain that, like, let's say, because I know a lot of people, like, will take Midol or something like that. Is this pain that if you pop the Midol, will it take it away? Oh, no. 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 Okay. Yeah. No ibuprofen, no Tylenol, no Midol will take care of that. Yeah. It's it's not even going to touch it. It's no. just... It's it, going to laugh at you. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's also a lot of pain, not just in, like, your like abdomen area but also I like I said I had a lot of back pain and that's really what was bothering me the most um a lot of migraines mm. I don't know if you had any I always got um still get hip pain and mm -hmm. it'll shoot down to my feet yeah it's almost like sciatic, sciatic pain. Yeah. yeah and it's only during my menstrual cycle and it's probably that because um everything gets inflamed so it's pinching on all these nerves and making everything super debilitating. Also, I, I've had to, I don't know if you have had this issue, but I've had to see a rheumatologist um, because I get like inflammation elsewhere. In your hands? Yeah. yeah. I got a lot of inflammation in my hands. Oh my gosh. And I thought, oh, it's because I type all day long. Um, but it's not. I get a lot of inflammation in my toes. <laughs> um, just like really in like my collarbone area. Well, just... you guys are still really young, so yeah. you should have like, yeah, it's very strange. Joy pain. <laughs> so you think, oh, it's just, I'm sitting all day long. I'm typing all day long. I'm cutting hair all day long. Like yeah. you think it's normal, but it's, it's not. But it's not. totally not. Yeah. So I'm reading here, um, intestinal pain. So how does that, this is probably super TMI, but this is a podcast so we can be a little transparent, but yeah. I know like, you know, sometimes we have our menstrual cycles and we have to go poop. Oh yeah. So, so... <laughs> For, for those of you that didn't know. <laughs> Girls poop. Girls poop when they are on their period. And it's not pretty. <laughs> um, so I think one of the times before, like it has had to have been like four or five years ago, right before my second surgery, I could not eat because I could not poop. And everything I did eat came out. I would barf it out. Oh, wow. So, imagine that. Yeah. Can't poop. Can't eat. Yeah. Everything you try to eat comes out. Freaking sucked. So, so nausea. Yeah. Can be Extreme. a trigger. Yeah. I'm just going to say here, because everything that I'm reading here and everything you guys are talking about sounds a lot like labor pain. <laughs> well, and then a lot of them... So, so... <laughs> A lot of doctors say it's like really. It's like you're similar. Pregnant. Yeah. So I got tripped That's out. That's what when it I was sounds like. like yeah. Everything you guys have said. Yeah. Like when I was throwing up every morning, I was like, "Oh shoot, were mm -hmm. they wrong?" Mm -hmm. And then to find out, like four months, five months later, like, "Oh no, I still have my period." <laughs> That's not happening. <laughs> so you get to to live in that, like. Yeah. I guess it's like that pregnancy that hormone life of labor. for like ever. <laughs> like it's yeah. awful. That is awful. Cause that's like not the, that's like definitely not the pretty side. <laughs> <laughs> no, Cause like, I'm thinking like back pain, you know, sciatic pain, throwing up, like those are, you know, things that yeah, you yeah. go through or and you can go through. It hurts. Like if you need to use a restroom, your intestines will hurt yeah. really bad. And it's weird to say your intestines hurt. For someone who doesn't know what it feels like but for your a, intestines to hurt, but it's you'll a feeling. know. <laughs> if you need to pee, your oh, bladder yeah. hurts so bad. Like it's, it's very strange. That's why I thought I had a bladder infection too. Oh. So these are all like little, not yeah. little, but big signs that. Yeah, things that you think are normal. Also, if you just start to like 
load up. Endo oh. belly is a real thing. It's so real. And it's so uncomfortable. You literally look like you're six months pregnant. Yeah. So there are four stages of endometriosis. So what are those four stages? It's just the severity of yeah. it. Um, I don't really... It's very strange, though, because someone who can surgically be diagnosed with stage four could have no symptoms. Exactly. Where someone who is stage one could be in bed every day for a week. Yeah. So it doesn't really correlate with um, how severe... Pain. Yeah, how severe your pain is. It has to do more with what's inside, um, as far as, like, how much adhesions and... Um, I can't remember what they're called. The endometriomal implants are or like how much of it you have uh, I should say that has to do with the stages okay and have you ever actually seen pictures of an of your endometriosis oh yeah I get pictures every after every surgery it's like a little prize you leave yeah I'm like, like when oh, you go to the at, dentist look at me on the inside <laughs> that's kind of freaking yeah, weird I it is. totally should have brought some I didn't think about it I know it. I have mine too but it looks like um uh she called it gunpowder oh yeah they're very, like, just little dots, and you think, oh, they're like, oh, there's some endometriosis. I'm like, where? That just looks like it a darker like piece of skin. Yeah, yeah, like, it's, like, not even a big deal. The adhesions are, or like, the scarring or what looks scarier. Yeah. But it's actually um, not considered to be as bad. But I think that's what hurts the, the most. most. Because it's pulling on everything. Yeah. So but it's, it's like, like you move. And then you can and feel, like, a... Because you know how when you move Marilla and you feel something <laughs> pull on you with your belly mm -hmm. that's so it's like round ligament pain kind of that's what well that's yes <laughs> that's <what it> is. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll probably have to share uh maybe we'll google a picture <laughs> and put what it looks like you your, your prize. on the inside <laughs> This is what oh. my lady bits look like on the inside. We'll put it on uh, our Instagram <laughs> so you guys can see. I'm actually very, like, curious myself. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> oh, did you ever have to get a colonoscopy? No. You've had a colonoscopy? Yes. So, and you have to be awake for that, right? Well, they... No, thank God. Oh. They put me to sleep. And well, so you have to do a colon cleanse to do that. Yes, and it's I, awful. I only know about this because... <laughs> My mother-in-law is, like, super, like, addicted to colon cleansers for some reason. Why? And I, I don't have any freaking clue. You might want to ask a curly colon, about that. Okay, guys. <laughs> it is alone. not worth it. <laughs> that is really the, like, topic of conversation every holiday is about how much you should take a colon cleanser. How clean her colon is. <laughs> <laughs> how fast that Thanksgiving food is going to move through her. <laughs> So tell, tell me, more, like, why did you have to have a, a colonoscopy? So the time that I was throwing up every day and couldn't poop, they thought I had a BMI issue. Okay. So they did a colonoscopy and realized that was not what was happening. And it was just the severity of the endometriosis had gotten so bad instead. It, it was, like, wow. wrapping on my intestine, making it hard for me to go to the bathroom. Or stopping me from going to the bathroom. They just always think it's something else, though. Yeah. They're like, no, your endometriosis cannot be that bad. Like, they wanted to give me um, muscle relaxers because she said I was having intestinal cramping. It almost sounds like doctors really just don't know. So they're, they're just throwing stuff, different stuff at you to try to figure it out. A thousand percent, because they don't know it. You know, you go in and yeah. see a primary care doctor. I was seen urgent care. I was went to 10 ER visits from 2013 to 2015. And they just dismiss you. You're having intestinal problems. You are constipated. You um, have a UTI. Let me go ahead and take an exam. Like, they just throw things at you and you think that makes total sense. Yeah. Like, I'm going to feel better after this. So how, so we kind of talked about uh, at the very beginning, because you said, <laughs> you know, Cal Optima. So, oh, yeah. So how does this all affect somebody who has to be on a Medi-Cal or Cal Optima? Because... Uh, you know, I just, like, again, I've had, like, my own experiences, yeah. and it's it's such a, to, in my opinion, there's lots of different departments. It's so confusing. And it's confusing, and all the departments don't really communicate with each yeah. other. So, as a person who needs to use Medi-Cal or Cal-Optima, mm -hmm. 
you know, you're kind of like playing phone tag. So how do you navigate through that? And how would you have any, I guess, advice for someone who has endometriosis? What can they do, I guess, to expedite treatment or help? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is to be your own advocate. Like, I can't stress that enough. Um, I don't just take an answer. You know your body better than anybody. So when they tell you you have intestinal issues and just take this colon cleanse and you're going to be fine and you don't feel like that's it, like, don't feel bad about having the doc going back and seeing a doctor. You know, they don't know everything and a lot of them are just trying to figure it out as well. I, I don't think that they're being malicious about it, but a lot of the times that they don't want to order that extra exam. I went in so many times before I got diagnosed. Had they just done an ultrasound the first or second time mm-hmm. that I went in, I would have saved myself so much time and pain and it's it's a hassle. Um the only issue with endometriosis is that They'll do surgery if you badger them enough, but they only do surgery where they cauterize the adhesions. So there's this thing called excision surgery Well, they where they will go in there. I guess the way that they explain it is it's kind of like a tree or a flower with a root. Um, instead of cauterizing and just taking it off of the top, excision surgery, they will actually go in and take it out from the root, and that way there's less chance of it growing back. No insurance will cover that. There, There's no, not just Medi-Cal, not just, and, and no insurance will cover it. You have to see an endometriosis specialist. So is, it, is that because it's still considered experimental? Yeah, and that's also because not, you won't find, I have Kaiser, you know, through my job, and there you won't find a single doctor through Kaiser, which is this big, huge, you know, company, a single doctor who knows what excision surgery is or how to perform it, I should say. See, I've never even heard of that. Yeah. So you go in, that's why we've had four surgeries, three surgeries. You're going in there and they're burning off the top of it. Yeah. There's still that part of it in you that is continuing to grow. So excision surgery is really the way to go. And where where can you get that and where did you learn about that? Is that, is that something that's available like, I don't know, Canada or something. No, there's doctors here in the States, um, but that's, like, through private insurance. Like, as far as I know, um, insurance that you have through, like, your work, like myself, or Medi-Cal okay. will not cover it. And I know because, actually, I had a member through Caloptima who called in and wanted to have excision surgery, and she was going to fight it till the death, and she didn't get it approved. And, you know, it's because they consider it like well you, there's doctors here who will do the cauterization and it's that's all you need and it's fine but it's not and i think that for anyone out there who, okay so they're so they're defining the cauterization as enough treatment yes. to lower the symptoms yeah but not actually solve the problem right because they say well there's no cure for endometriosis. Mm-hmm. So what makes, why would they cover excision surgery, which is more expensive, only a certain amount of doctors will do it. I know there's a few doctors in San Francisco. There's one in Atlanta. There's one in New York. So this is definitely like a specialty. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. What kind of doctor should somebody go see if they have, or they think they have endometriosis? Do they go to a gynecologist or is there somebody, another type of specialist? Like, is there anybody else that they should go to no they definitely need to see an OBGYN for sure yeah I guess to kind of switch off into something a little because we got kind of deep in here (laughs) real deep (laughs) uh so we looked up some celebs that um have it and are huge advocates for it which I think is super important because you know just even having this hour-long talk with you ladies like it's definitely I've my brain is full (laughs) um and I'm sure there's like tons more to to learn and know about it but I thought this was kind of like interesting a little list here so uh Whoopi Goldberg (laughs) I actually did not know Yeah, she has a CBD company too it is amazing yeah it's really cool so good so she has a a CBD and THC infused line of menstrual products. So have any of you guys used those? Yes. Yeah, I have too. I like them. You like them? Yeah, Yeah. I do. You find them helpful? Oh yeah. Like what, what specifically have you used that she has that you've used and liked? Or have you found that it's helpful? I've used the CBD orally and also like topical CBD. Is it like that chocolate stuff that she sells? Yeah. Yeah. So the line is called Whoopi and Maya. 
I've actually used the bath soak. Oh. And it is fantastic. I felt like butter afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> does does Whoopi Goldberg have like her own, I guess, Instagram page or uh, Facebook or anything that's like linked to her products? Um, they, they have, have the website. My, uh, so maybe we can put that on Instagram. the yeah. Instagram for people to like check that out. Dolly Parton. I thought, I mean, I actually knew about Dolly Parton because, uh, I don't know. I, I just remember her mentioning it, but I, again, like I never really like paid attention to yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, and she's like a super, you know, icon and somebody who's, uh, like amazingly talented songwriter. Mm-hmm. She wrote lots of different uh, songs for lots of artists. So uh, you wrote here that she had a partial hysterectomy in 1982. So actually, how long have we known about endometriosis? That's actually a really good question. That's a great question. I'm not sure. 1982, that's a year after I was born. <laughs> but I wonder if they knew what it was then or if it was just like, mm, you're having, yeah. we should have researched that. <laughs> we should have. Missed uh, the opportunity. <laughs> Cindy Lauper. Cindy Lauper. And how, and how how did you like? How do you know? Like, what what things have they done or shared or said? Well, this was thanks to Google. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cindy Lauper. I didn't read too much about it. It just said that she mentioned something about um, her struggles with endometriosis before she had her child. Okay. Uh, Tia Mowry. I actually did not know yeah, that. Yeah. Did I? I did. I have her uh, cookbook, which is supposed to be geared toward people with endo because it's oh. like anti-inflammatory foods but I like it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know <laughs> yeah it wasn't great well that's kind of interesting so what kind of foods are anti-inflammatory um you're but- supposed to stay away from soy that's a big one that i thought i was doing good by staying away from dairy and i would eat a lot of soy, soy. but soy is actually an estrogen. inflammatory. Yeah, it's estrogen. Soy so is it. actually just terrible for yeah. you across the board. Oh, yeah. I think a lot of, especially like vegans or vegetarians, we eat a lot of soy. Yeah. And you think it's good for you because it's a plant and it's this, that. It's but awful. It's, yeah, it's awful. Terrible. It's the worst thing you can have for yeah. yourself, which I don't even know why they give it to babies because they have like soy. Soy milk m- for babies. Yeah. And stuff. Yeah. I know. But it's, it's such a, um, you know, a hormone driver and it's terrible like for people who are, you know, have a high risk of cancer. Um, now I'm like learning right now, like yeah. endometriosis. So it's like, why do we even freaking make soy anything? Yeah. yeah. Just stay away from that. Okay. For sure. Uh, sugar, sugar, um, actually feeds tumors and cysts. And you like to eat freaking donuts all the time, lady? I do. <laughs> <laughs> no more donuts for you. You shouldn't have said anything. Try and stop me. <laughs> I'll do my donut lunges across the salon. <laughs> uh, Any kind of sugar. Yeah. No sugar. Kind of sugar. Okay. So, so you gluten. can't necessarily like eat a lot of fruit. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Gluten. Gluten. They say. They say. They say. Okay. Yeah. I tried for a while to cut gluten and um, sugar out of my diet and I didn't see a, a big difference, but I think everyone's different. Yeah. For um, sure. So... You know, try it. It's worth a try. Red meat is definitely a big one. For sure. Do not eat that. Yeah. So what are things that you should eat? Anything that's full of fiber. So like uh, dark green, leafy. So kale. Lots of kale. Yeah. Lots of kale. Kale is my friend. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I, um, we were talking about turmeric earlier. Yeah. They sell them in like little capsules and mm-hmm. it's supposed to be really good for anti Oh, is that why you so. gave me this turmeric, uh, I actually have ginger the turmeric capul- capsules oh. every day. Yeah. Okay. See. Is it turmeric or turmeric? I don't know. Tomato, tomato. I say <laughs> turmeric, but. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong. No, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to look it up now. Um, <laughs> ginger is really good for you. Yeah. Because it's also anti-inflammatory. Uh, what else? I don't even know at this point. I don't know. I just got a, a whole anti-inflammatory diet sheet oh, I list know which one you're talking from about. a doctor. The AIP diet or something yeah. like that? Yeah. That's not fun. No. Yeah. Well, actually, so you, you want to share, like, what your doctor told <laughs> you in your last visit? Because so you went to a, a new doctor. <laughs> No, I can already imagine. Basically, 
I am too heavy uh-huh. and I need to lose weight and then things will get better. Yeah. Which to a degree, I agree. Oh, do you feel better when you're thinner? Of course you yeah. do. But it's like they act like it's the, the end of the world. Answer to everything. When you walk in there and you've got like 20, 30, 30 50 pounds more, <laughs> um, you're just kind of like, that's going to solve it. I'm in here. It's happened so many times. I'm in here for pain and you're telling me to go lose weight, which is going to take me a year to do. Yeah. You know, like I'll be back in a year. I actually, <laughs> I, you know, I was, uh, cause you were telling me that basically she told you you are Thorta and that that's going to fix, you know, everything if you lose weight. <laughs> so I always like thinking about it though, because I was like, um, I've, I've taken birth control in my life maybe it makes you three gain times. And every time I've taken it, I gain a, shitload of weight and then I become the psycho crazy Morella. Bitch. yeah yeah so I ended up not taking it but that's what I got prescribed but uh, yeah <laughs> that's, so it's like how do you lose weight and take birth control how do you lose weight and you're not able to exercise yeah yeah because it, it's really sad because people will think I'm making an excuse where I can't do high impact I can't do any impact exercises right <laughs> so like I will try a workout one day, even walking, hiking, and I'm out for a week. Like, yeah. it just affects you so much. So it's it really hard. And when I think of low impact, I'm thinking swimming, and you really can't swim either <laughs> if you're on your <laughs> cycle. So I, I would assume I that you don't want wanna... <laughs> <laughs> They say yoga because it just kind of de-stresses you, too. Oh, and it I, I like yoga. Yeah. I actually have a great question. So, um, cause I, me personally, I cannot use tampons. Like they mm. actually make me physically ill. I think like I've probably been like borderline, you know, uh, what, what is it called? Like, uh, is it called toxic shock syndrome oh, yeah. or whatever? Yes, yes. So it, I like, I've used a tampon, like again, a handful of times in my life. And I will, like, feel super sick and nauseous. And it's, like, the moment I've taken it out, it's, like, this relief. So if you have endometriosis, um, is, you know, using tampons, like, a no-go? Or do they tell you to use? Um, I don't. It's fine. I've always kind of used them. But I think that opens up another can of worms with people who have endo and who have pain during sex. Okay. Yeah. Um, I yeah, it'll it'll hurt, but it's fine. I think I've always just kind of used them. So you you use them, yeah. and you're fine with them. Yeah. Okay, I was just curious about that, and I try not to use them because they they I can't use them at all. Yeah, all my friends my whole life, like even as a teenager, they were like, oh, just use a tampon, and I'm like, no, dude, I'm I'm cool with the, like the 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 bloody diapers. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's all good. <laughs> I'll walk around looking like a duck butt, but I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> People hear you coming, like when you're walking. <laughs> no, seriously. Yeah. And my mom used to buy me those really huge ass like pads. Like I think they were like the ones for like people. the ones that came in a box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like but they're like, you get it in gym. Yeah. <laughs> you have to get the little. They're all like depends. <laughs> they're cute. And then you sit down, you can feel it. Yeah, it's, you're like, elevated like, oh. on this pad. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's cushioned for your your uh, tailbone. <laughs> They reach back there. They may as well be. That's how long mine were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs overnight pads? <laughs> so, um, some really great accounts and web pages to follow. I don't know if you kind of wanted to go over some of these, but speakindo.com, Indo of, what is that? <laughs> That's Endofound. Endofound? Yeah, Endofound.org. It was actually co-founded by Padma Lakshmi. Okay. who is really big in the culinary industry. Okay. She's a really big um, advocate for endometriosis. So I'm assuming, like, that website probably has, like, great recipes to follow. Um, It'll give you good advice as far as, like, what to ask your doctor. Um, it even lists a few doctors yeah, in your area. Yeah, it'll give you doctors in your area. That's great. So you, there's doctors that specialize. Yeah. In- there's our yeah. endo... Do- I mean, if you have the means to do it please before any doctor does any type of surgery before you know you continue with those invasive surgeries go see an endo specialist i don't i can't afford it but same please (laughs) if you can do yourself a favor and so a lot of these will probably um you know again we'll list um on our instagram but there's some great pages here too you said 
Indo Spoon has great res- recipes. Yeah, so they're all um, pretty much vegan recipes that you can follow that actually help with anti-inflammatory and just pain management in general. And, and we know already, like, plant-based diet actually does a lot of healing it does. in yeah. itself. So that's that's awesome. Um, that's definitely something, like, I could even look at into. So um, I know I feel better if I, like, you or eat mostly just feel plants. Cleaner. You just feel, yeah, you just feel good. And you poop a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> yay, poop. <laughs> my favorite pastime <laughs> up speak and do so what kind the of next ones that? are more like support okay so the endo project endo strong and then mab graves yeah so she's a really awesome artist on instagram who has been a pretty good advocate as far as her whole endometriosis journey I believe she had a full-on hysterectomy yeah. a year ago. And how old is she? She's 30. She may be a little older than us, right? Yeah. I don't think she's too much older than, yeah. like, maybe mid-30s. That is just, like, Late so 30s. insane to me to, like, I mean, I'm 38, and I can't imagine getting a full hysterectomy yeah. at my age. So it's just, like, that's heavy to make that decision. And she yeah. actually created that hashtag, Sick Girls Club, which is my favorite thing to yeah. use. <laughs> Awesome. Is there anything else that you want to share? I don't know. I think just for anyone with a chronic illness, be kind to them. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I, I have a lot more uh, understanding today. That's for <laughs> sure. So yeah. I know for me, this was like a lot to, to take in <laughs> and to see you do a cry. It's a lot. I don't cry unless it has to do. That is a lie. You cry every time I no, talk no, no, about no. your mom. I, that's what I was getting at. I cry if it's about my mom and if it's about pregnancies. No. That's when I cry. I cry all the time. So this was a regular day for me. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on our show. You're our first thank guest. You. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Yay. This was really great. And for everybody else, thanks to you. So thanks you. Thank thanks you so, you. so much for listening and um, catch us every Monday morning for new episodes and follow us on rebel femme underscore podcast on Instagram. And we'll see you next week. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>